Hello, I'm Wendy and that's Beth. Hello. And we would like to take a moment to welcome new listeners. So welcome, Buiti Binafi and Bienvenidos Bitches to Fruit Loops Serial Killers of Color. Fruit Loops Serial Killers of Color is a weekly podcast hosted by us, mm-hmm. a multiracial, multigenerational set of BFFs. How did we get here? Well, when we realized that podcasts like ours about marginalized perpetrators and victims with hosts like us didn't exist, we just decided to do it ourselves. Yes, so join us as we tell the fascinating stories of the crimes and the victims that often go untold by the mainstream media. And because context is everything, we often add in historical and cultural details of the crimes and criminals in order to get a sense of what might have led to these crimes. We love talking about true crime, but we also use these true crime stories as an opportunity to talk about race relations, systemic racism, policing, history, and culture. We learn something new every day, and we hope that you do too. We are really excited to share that Apple Podcasts has featured us as a creator we love throughout the year. Apple Podcast celebrates well-established podcasters leading their categories, and we were selected for true crime. Hey, Bob Ear Horns! <laughs> <laughs> so dive into our feed and share an episode with a friend. You can expect to hear a new episode every Thursday. Oh, and uh, be forewarned, we do sometimes use explicit language, and some of the content we discuss may be disturbing to some listeners. But we also have a lot of fun, so join us. On a hot summer night in 1988, Jane Borowski was stabbed 27 times by an unknown man. She was seven months pregnant. My name is Jane Borowski. I survived, and I remember everything. Jane is the lone survivor of a serial killer. I'm your host, Jennifer Amell, and this is Dark Valley. Join us in our search for America's unknown serial killer. Subscribe to Dark Valley, out now. This podcast contains adult themes and language, and some of the things that we discuss may be disturbing to some listeners. In this podcast, we discuss sexual assault, torture, race, and murder. Listener discretion is advised. Please take care of yourself. to Fruit Loops episode 210. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Binafi, bienvenidos bitches. And thank you so much for listening. Yeah. Fruit Loops is a podcast about true crimes committed by people of color and those who are othered and the victims because contrary to popular belief, not all serial killers are straight, cisgender, able-bodied, white dudes. What? <laughs> You're not going to believe this. They rarely get <laughs> any public attention because... The news is racist. Allegedly is what I'm supposed to say. It's written here, (laughs) but I'm not so sure. Anyway. (laughs) And we are Wendy and Beth. She's Wendy, a Black Latinx woman. And I'm Beth, and I just happen to be white. That's right. She's one of the good ones. (laughs) She's one of the good white people. (laughs) And we're not journalists, investigators, or psychologists. Just a couple of gals interested in true crime. Also, the opinions expressed in this podcast are just that, our opinions. All right, so who are we talking about today, friend? Well, we are going to be telling you a really kind of nutty and Uh scary story today. Check, check, yep. About Mm -hmm. Fidel Caffey and Jacqueline Annette Williams, who murdered a pregnant woman and cut her full-term fetus from her womb because they wanted a baby. And not only that, but they also murdered two of the woman's children. Okay, so this is a lot. Yeah. Before we get into it, though, how you doing? I'm doing good. I love this time of year. Yeah, I am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to say happy almost Halloween to our listeners. Yeah. I hope you're having a spooky time. <laughs> Me too. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> I do have a Halloween costume. I'm going to be God's gift. 
in a, <laughs> just a giant box that I will put myself in. It's covered in wrapping paper and bows. Um, and my family doesn't want to be seen with me. Also, you know, I've been watching a lot of TikTok lately. It's, I feel like oh, it's like a TikTok. hug for my eyeballs. Yeah. Yeah, and there's this really funny video of this little black girl singing "Nationwide," like she's an old lady in church. Yeah, "Nationwide is on your side," and I can't stop watching <laughs> all the people who are like redoing it, doing duets. It's so fun. Anyway, my family hates me for that too. Um, so my my favorite right now is the Susie stitches. Have you seen those? No. No. So there's this lady, she's cooking and uh she's like, "Well, call me crazy, but I never liked store-bought pesto." And then people stitch onto it and they're like, "That's crazy, Susie, but you know what's really crazy?" And they tell some wild ass stories. Oh, whoa. Okay. <laughs> Susie stitches. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I might have to check that out. Yeah, I have to send one to you. Yes, please do. Speaking of uh, nationwide is on your side. <laughs> Magic Mind is on your side, friend. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, yeah, I so, love Magic Mind. Oh, my gosh. I love it as well. It is these amazing little green shots full of goodness. Yeah. It's a little sweet, not too sweet. It's got matcha for energy. Oh, the energy. To help yeah. you relax all the relaxation <laughs> and the new tropics to get you focused. It also has like vitamins, like vitamin C, vitamin D, and echinacea. <laughs> You're going back to your English accent again. That's huh? right. Vitamins, <laughs> bruv. So give it a try. And the other really cool thing is if you don't like it, it doesn't work for you. No problem, man. You could just get all your money back. No questions asked. Yeah. So thanks. Love Magic it. Mind. Love you. Now let's get into some a listener. A letter. Okay. Oh, such a relief to hear that. Yes. Song. I love thank you, it. angels. <laughs> What's in your bag, Beth? Well, I wanted to say thank you to Mademoiselle Mads, mm. TL Lane. Mm. Kirsty 18, mm. H Alicia 2754, oh. and Pasta for Pigeons for your Man. five star reviews. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you. Oh, everyone, we love it. Thank you. Yeah. We are so appreciative. Hey, did you see that review where the person was like, I wanted to rip my ears for my yeah. head? Yeah. Oh my God. I laughed <laughs> so hard. I know it was meant to be really mean and hurt. But it, it was funny. Yeah. But it was hilarious. <laughs> Who is that person? <laughs> so I uh, wanted to say please send any questions or comments to fruitloopspod at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail at 602 935 6294. And we may feature it on a future episode. Also, join us on Patreon, where we have literally hundreds of hours of bonus content. And we have a video club for 12 plus patrons where you can interact with us in person. And we're having our meeting on October 29th, on Sunday, October 29th. Very exciting. I cannot wait. Yeah. Um, because the documentary is flipping wild. <laughs> Oh my God. I, wow. Okay. So speaking of patrons, we got some new ones and we just thank y'all so much for supporting our little show. Uh, we got Corey E. We got Mel L. We got Steve G, Sue H and Alex G. Thank you all so much for supporting yeah, our you. show. And here are your tunes. Hope you don't hate them. So, Corey, this is for you. Say my name, say my name. We thank you so much, Corey. No boo, you not boring. Help us make a change. Say my name, say my name. Corey. Um, Mel, this is for you. Mel chimed in with the haven't you people ever heard of supporting the Patreon. Oh, and uh, Steve G, this is for you. Been around the world and I, 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 I can't find my Steve J. I don't know when, I don't know why, but he's gone away. Um, Sue, this is for you. 
hold on to your love, Sue. <laughs> and then Alex G. You're down with Alex G. Yeah, you know me. <laughs> uh, so thank you all for supporting our little show. Yeah, thank you. And we love you. So we are going to take a quick break and we're going to get into the story when we come back. We would like to take this moment to tell you about our sponsor, Magic Mind. So Magic Mind came into my life at the exact right time. My life is very busy. I'm a podcaster. I have a full-time job. I have children, a partner. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I have a full-time job and a second full-time job podcasting. So I don't know how you do all of those things. Uh, Me neither. (laughs) But all of those things (laughs) require focus and attention. Frankly, I cannot survive without caffeine. Usually my caffeine intake consists of in the morning, first thing, Coke Zero, two caffeine pills. Then coffee, green tea throughout the rest of the day, pop another caffeine pill or two if I need it. And when you have that much caffeine in your system, it makes it almost impossible to sleep. So I also have to take sleep aids. It's a mess. Yeah, (laughs) but cut to magic mind. Yes. So I was skeptical, but I tried it for a week and I swear I did not need the caffeine pills or coffee. Wow. Yeah, it was. I was like, oh, I haven't had any coffee today. I love it. It makes it easy to incorporate it into my morning routine. It's this little tasty shot. And so after seven days of drinking magic mind, I had mental energy. I noticed I was more focused. I was more productive. I was sleeping better and generally less stressed and anxious. Nice. And my husband is like this super like health conscious guy. And he tried it too and he loves it too. Magic Mind is the world's first productivity drink. It's got all natural ingredients sourced from the best suppliers they could find. There is no sugar. It's nut free, vegan, keto, and paleo friendly. It's got ingredients that you can actually pronounce. Whoa. And regular degular folks can understand like honey, ashwagandha, and lion's mane, Ooh. which is an adaptogen that reduces stress and anxiety. Yes, all good stuff. And also ingredients that I'm not sure what they do, but saying them sure makes me feel good and sound smart. Try it. (laughs) Say adaptogens and nootropics. So if you're thinking, whoa, Wendy is a sexy genius. How does she do it? Well, (laughs) Magic Mind definitely helps. (laughs) And Magic Mind also has a 100% money back guarantee. No questions asked. So there's no risk. If you don't like it, you can get a refund. Magic Mind stands behind their product because it works. It works for me and I bet it can work for anyone out there struggling with energy, focus, and generally wanting to feel better. So go to magicmind.com slash Fruit Loops and get up to 56% off your subscription for the next 10 days with our code Fruit Loops 20. The code again is Fruit Loops 20. Just go to the website and get 56% off your subscription. All right, we're back. Remind us, Beth, who is our subject again today? Today, our subject is Fidel Caffey and Jacqueline Annette Williams a couple who murdered a pregnant woman for her baby and also murdered two of her children because they were witnesses. Boy, oh boy, there's a lot to get into. First, uh, let's get into some love and light to the victims. So rest in power to Deborah Evans, who was 28. Her daughter, Samantha, was also killed. She was 10. And her son, Joshua, Joshua was eight. Jordan, who was 22 months old, survived. And Elijah Eli James Evans, a newborn, also survived. Yeah, that's amazing. Unbelievable. So rest in power to all of the victims, also love and light to the communities and everybody left in the wake of this horrific crime. So let's get into the setting. Take us there, Beth. Well, this story takes place in the suburbs of Chicago in DuPage County, west of Chicago. Chicago is located in Cook County. Oh. The area is the traditional homelands of the Anishinaabe, a group of culturally related indigenous peoples present in the Great Lakes region of Canada and the United States. So they include the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi nations, often referred to as the Council of the Three Fires. Many other nations consider this area their traditional homeland, including the Miamia, Ho-Chunk, Menominee, Sac and Fox, Peoria, Kaskaskia, Wea, Kickapoo, and Maskutin. Black people have a long history in Chicago, 
going back to the 1780s mm-hmm. and the city's founder, Jean-Baptiste Pont du Sable, mm. a Haitian man of African and French descent. Ah. Chicago was incorporated as a town in 1833 with a population of about 300. Fugitive enslaved people and freedmen established the city's first Black community in the 1840s. Black and white abolitionists were active in Chicago, but Black people still suffered from segregation and Black Chicagoans could neither vote nor testify against white people in court. Following the end of Reconstruction in 1877, which failed only because of violence perpetrated by white people, Reconstruction was the shit. But anyway, many Black folks moved to Chicago, raising the population from approximately 4,000 in 1870 to 15,000 in 1890. On October 8, 1871, a fire broke out in a barn on the southwest side of Chicago. Oh, I've heard of this. Yeah. Yeah. Called the Great Chicago Fire, it burned for more than 24 hours through the heart of Chicago, Ooh. killing 300 people, destroying roughly 3.3 square miles of the city, including over 17,000 structures. And it left more than 100,000 residents or one in three residents without homes. Oh, my gosh. That yeah. is a lot of people displaced. Devastating. Yeah. And then H.H. H. Holmes comes and is like, yeah. <laughs> place to build my new horror hotel. Horror hotel. <laughs> Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. <laughs> so the great, the great rebuilding. There's so many greats. The great, yeah. the great <laughs> fire. <laughs> and the great rebuilding was the effort to construct a new urban center. Big businesses, innovative buildings, and a new style of architecture were the results. The city established the fire limits, which eliminated the construction of wooden single-family homes in the city center, replacing them with brick buildings. Oh, These wooden homes had housed the city's working class. The brick construction was too expensive for these people to afford, so these new fire codes effectively drove out the city's working class homeowners and downtown became a commercial center. That's so interesting. Yeah. I'm sure it was an unintended consequence. Right. Well, but I that's mean, what I happened. I hope so. Yeah. But that's what happened. Yeah. So unable to rebuild, the city's workers fanned out across the city limits, driving Chicago's first great wave of great suburban- Great wave. The great suburbanization. The great, <laughs> the great wave of suburbanization. What had been a fairly dense and mixed city became a more separated city with new pressure for marginalized folks to move further out of the city. Throughout the 19th century and into the 20th century, most of DuPage County excluded Black people and other people of color from settling and working locally through racially restrictive covenants. Some of these towns were actually sundown towns. Terrifying! Talk about a horror movie. I know. Seriously. Seriously. True crime. (laughs) Yeah. True crime America. Yeah, I'm I'm afraid. So most black workers lived in Aurora, Joliet. Wait a minute. Aurora. That's where Wayne's World's from. Aurora, Illinois. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, So most black workers lived in Aurora and Joliet and Chicago, cities with established black communities. Although these restrictive covenants were ruled legally unenforceable by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1948. (laughs) Do you think laws stopped racism? Uh, They continued to appear on some property deeds well into the 1960s. (laughs) Chicago has the third largest urban Black population in the nation, mostly the result of a huge influx of Black folks during both of the Great Migrations in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Most were attracted by the city's railway companies, steel mills, and meatpacking houses for work. Mm -hmm. In 1910, the Black population in Chicago was 44,000. By 1930, it was 235,000. Wow. That is is really um, quite a spike. Yeah. And yeah, a lot of Chicagoans have Southern roots. Yeah. Black people in Chicago always struck me as very (laughs) Southern-ish. Southern adjacent. Southern adjacent. Yeah. But Chicago has been losing Black residents for decades. The Black population's peak came in 1980 when it reached nearly 1.19 million people. 
Over the next 40 years, that figure declined by roughly 400,000. Some of this was the result of the new Great Migration, a reversal of the earlier migrations where Black folks have been moving back to the South since the 1990s. Mm -hmm. But some are moving further west from Chicago into the suburbs of DuPage County. Still, as of 2020, the percentage of Black people in DuPage County is less than 5%. Ooh, okay. So now let's get into the early life of Fidel and Annette. So Jacqueline Annette Williams, who went by Annette, was born December 22nd, 1966 in Alabama. When her parents got divorced, uh, her mother took her and her siblings to live in Chicago. The family then left Chicago for what was perceived as a better, safer life in the Chicago suburb of Wheaton in DuPage County. According to her mother and her sister, Annette had a normal childhood, but as a teenager, she began to rebel. When she was 17, she got pregnant and dropped out of school. By the age of 20, she had three children and a husband. Wow. Wow. Ooh, that's a lot. That's a that's a she's a baby herself and a full three, a whole ass husband at 20. Ah! That's that's a lot. Yeah. So several years later, she was divorced, a single mom and struggling to get by. She had a history of arrests for theft and check fraud, but nothing violent. Mostly, those, are, those are crimes of survival, right? Right. Exactly. So while on probation, she earned her certification as a nurse's assistant. When she was 27, she met Fidel Caffey, a younger black man. He was 21. Fidel was born in 1973 in Schaumburg, Illinois, into a chaotic and unstable home. Both his mother and maternal grandmother had been diagnosed with schizophrenia. Mm. They often exhibited very distorted thinking and bizarre behaviors. Wow. And I can only imagine in the 70s, 80s, 90s, how chaotic that would have been. Yeah. Uh, His father outright rejected him, believing that Fidel's mother had been sleeping around and Fidel was not his child. Fidel turned to his grandfather as the closest thing he had to a stable parent. But his grandfather died in 1991, which devastated him. Soon after, he fathered a child with his high school girlfriend. But that relationship didn't last. After graduating, he began dealing crack and hired his friend Laverne Ward to be a drug courier. Two years later, he met Ward's cousin, Annette Williams, and she soon moved in with him. All right, now let's get into the timeline. So... Williams, not me or Beth, was subject (laughs) to violent mood swings, which Caffey was used to because of his upbringing. The relationship became toxic, filled with arguments, manipulation, threats, and sometimes violence. Williams practiced quote-unquote voodoo to try to control Caffey. And I say quote-unquote because it probably was not actually voodoo. It was Mm. probably something she made up. Oh. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Or something she heard about, but uh, it doesn't sound like she was an actual voodoo practitioner. Okay. Okay. Got it. She also used violence once stabbing him. Another time she attacked him with a baseball bat. Other times, yeah. (laughs) She got a little violent. Yeah. Wow. Other times she threatened to unalive herself. In a distorted idea of love, Caffey took these actions as proof of Williams' love for him. Oh, my goodness. We can all see this is not going to end well, right? going well, yeah. Okay, so Caffey continued to have sexual relations with other women, including his former girlfriend, Katrina, with whom he had a child. Williams did not like Caffey's relationship with Katrina, and the two women had several physical And verbal altercations from 1994 through 1995. She snatched my wig. (laughs) I just always thought it was so interesting. Remember Monica and Brandy? The boy is mine. The boy is mine. Yeah, yeah. Um, But why are we fighting over this boy? Why are they fighting over men? Yeah. Why are we fighting each other? We need to get him. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) According to Kathy and another acquaintance, Williams also had a history of faking pregnancies. Williams was unable to have any more children because she'd had her tubes tied after her third child. And she was only, what, 28? Oh, 27. Wow. 27. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But three is a lot. But yeah. so it, 
makes total sense. Right. But she apparently, you know, wasn't ready for that. And, you know, I sometimes, I mean, the tubes tied thing, sometimes an OBGYN will just do it after you've had a certain number of children. especially without even asking? Without asking you, especially. Yeah. I mean, I'm... I might be conflating my cases, but I'm thinking of Fannie Lou Hamer. She was sterilized without her consent. What year? That happened. Because I know that used to happen back in like the mid-century. Yeah. uh, Into some of the later decades. But uh, nowadays, I don't, I don't know. I don't know either, but I'm just I mean, I think you could probably sue a doctor. You could, but. She is a woman of color. And so I wonder, you know, sometimes practitioners assume things about women of color and their health. Or they just decide that this is what's best. Exactly. So she had her tubes tied. I'm just not 100% sure that she chose to ask for it. Yeah. Yeah. So um, Kathy claimed that he did not know about William's tubal ligation or her inability to conceive any more children. According to Williams, Kathy wanted to be a father, and he kept pressuring Williams about getting a baby. Just go to the baby store. Specifically, he wanted (laughs) a light-skinned baby because he was light-skinned. Okay. So Kathy says he doesn't know that she couldn't have kids. Williams claims that he did know. So okay. it's a there's a little little difference of opinion there. Well, okay. All right. Here we go. <laughs> In February of nineteen ninety five, Williams began to fake a pregnancy. According to her, Kathy knew what she was doing. She told friends at her baby shower that the baby was due in August. She then moved the due date to October, and on November first, she told her probation officer that she had given birth to a baby boy, but Williams was still without a baby. According to Kathy, he did not know that Williams was faking the pregnancy. Oh, my God. (laughs) Um, I haven't seen, you know, on TV shows and movies, especially in the 90s. People would fake pregnancies all the time. Yeah. They just put a pillow in it and, you know, get away with it and. I used to watch a lot of soap operas, Days of Our Lives, all of them. Would they do that all the time? On those? Lots of fake pregnancies. Yeah. yeah. But after she kept changing the due date, by October, he had stopped believing that she was pregnant. According to Williams, Laverne Ward presented her with a solution to her baby problem. His ex-girlfriend, Deborah Evans, was about to give birth to a new baby. Deborah was the mother of three children, 10-year-old Samantha, eight-year-old Joshua, and 22-month-old Jordan, and she was nine months pregnant with her fourth child. She was white and Ward was black, so the baby would likely be light-skinned. This is crazy. But yeah. do you remember when Meghan Markle was interviewed by Oprah and they were talking about how the royal family asked about how dark the kids would be? Right. And everyone was like, oh my God! the royals are racist yeah nobody was surprised by that but what is interesting is that black people have that conversation all the time i wonder i mean oh yeah the colorism i wonder yeah, yeah the colorism stuff people talk about people's shades and you know being light skinned is uh often desirable because you resemble the colonizer more and light skin there you know there's light skin privilege and and things right, like that right just something to think about but anyway deborah joe evans was born may 6th 1967 and was raised in southern illinois her cousin described her as quote fun loving laughter seeking friend who loved to go dancing who loved children and was open and forgiving to everyone in her life deborah was a beautiful person and an excellent mother and that's what should be talked about unquote Deborah and a man named James Edwards had been in a relationship since 1989. Deborah's sister described it as on again, off again, and they had separated several times. During one of their separations, Deborah started seeing Laverne Ward. She gave birth to Ward's son, Jordan, in 1994. She became pregnant again in 1995, but the couple broke up. 
When Deborah and Ward lived together, he beat her multiple times, and Deborah took out a restraining order against him for domestic violence. He's got anger issues. He sure does. Yeah. Yeah. In March of 1995, Deborah and James reconciled, and he moved back into their apartment. Katie Evans, Deborah's younger sister, later testified that Deborah had feared for her safety because she was being harassed by Ward. Deborah was due to go to the hospital on November 19th to have labor induced. She had planned to name the child Elijah. In November, a few days before the murders, Williams procured a gun from her friend Vicky Ayacuyo, telling her that she needed the 25 caliber handgun for protection in a drug deal. On November 16th, 1995, at around 5.30 p.m., Deborah's boyfriend, James Edwards, left the couple's apartment to go to work. James worked across the street from their apartment in Addison, Illinois, a suburb northeast of Wheaton. That same evening, Annette Williams, 28, and her boyfriend, Fidel Caffey, 22, and her cousin, Laverne Ward, 24, knowing James's work schedule, went to see Deborah Evans at her apartment. Although Deborah had a restraining order against Ward, she did allow the group into her home. Oh, yeah. once inside, Ward tried to make Deborah accept $2,000 in exchange for her baby. When she refused, Caffey pulled out a gun and shot her in the head. Then Ward and Caffey hunted down oh, Deborah's daughter, Samantha, and stabbed her to death. The gun had jammed, so they made do with poultry shears. Deborah's son, Joshua, was able to hide, and they did not find him. Williams, Caffey, and Ward then used the shears and a knife to cut Deborah open and then remove the unborn male fetus from her womb. Mm. Williams performed mouth-to-mouth resuscitation on the infant, and once he was breathing on his own, she cleaned him in the kitchen sink and then dressed him in a sleeper. That's so... Oh. Uh, Morbid? The, well, up. yeah, but the two things, uh, killing people cutting somebody open and then bathing a baby and dressing him in a sleeper. It's just so weird. Yeah. Is that, um, smart friend, is that like a oxymoron? The, all the death no. in the face no. of life? No. No. Okay. What um, is that? Is there a German word for it? What is it? Uh, <laughs> tell me now! <laughs> <laughs> there is a word that I was trying to think of, but it, it, it's uh, escaped. It, it's escaped my mind. Well, then what? you good for i'm nothing. out of here just nothing. kidding just kidding <laughs> just kidding friend so leaving 22 month old jordan in the apartment with his dead mother and sister the trio took the infant elijah and left once they left eight-year-old joshua who had seen what had happened ran outside to get help and unfortunately bumped into williams the trio then took him with them and went to the apartment of a friend patrice scott at around midnight. This just breaks my heart. I know. Poor little I don't, boy. I don't want to. Yeah. I don't want to do this I story anymore. Him. I know. I want him to get away. <laughs> Me too. Oh, yeah. Poor thing. Listen to Mr. Bunker's Conspiracy Time podcast. It's a fun show about weird stuff. New episodes every Wednesday, you eggheads. I'm Art. And I'm Andy. And Mr. Bunker's Conspiracy Time is a podcast about conspiracies, the paranormal, UFOs, unsolved mysteries. We're going to be discussing the Kennedy assassinations. Oh, yeah. That's his nickname, Finger Banging Bob Lazar. Give me some aliens with some good frickin' spacecraft. The whole enchilada. (laughs) The only thing bigger than Bigfoot's feet are our egos. If you like simulation theory, ancient history, egghead science, and Mandela effect, that kind of stuff. So check it out. New episodes every Wednesday. All the links you need on MrBunkersConspiracyTime.com. And we'll see you in the bunker. The crime was so brutal it was compared to the Manson murders. Mary and Bill, an Ohio cold case, explores what it takes to bring new attention to an unsolved double homicide and turns up new hope for answers. Listen to Mary and Bill, an Ohio cold case from IdeaStream Public Media, wherever you get your podcasts.
Patrice lived with Dwight Pruitt and her three daughters. Her youngest daughter, Alexis, was only one and a half months old. About a month earlier, Williams told Patrice that she was pregnant and she was going to have the baby in November. Williams' knock at the door awoke Dwight. He rose, went to the door, and saw Williams and a boy. Dwight returned to bed and told Patrice who answered the door. Williams was wearing James's starter jacket and a white sweater spotted with blood. Hmm. Joshua was wearing a t-shirt, coat, and boots. He was not wearing socks or pants. Hmm? Williams told Patrice that Joshua's mother had been shot and that Williams was going to visit her in the hospital. She asked Patrice if Joshua could spend the night at her apartment, and Patrice agreed. Oh my gosh. No follow-up questions? Yeah. So William said she would come back in the morning to get him. And oh, by the way, she had given birth and would bring the new baby with her in the mornings for Patrice to see. (laughs) What? (laughs) After Williams left, Patrice put Joshua to bed on the living room couch. She heard Joshua whimpering and crying throughout the night. Oh, my God. James Edwards returned home from work at 2.30 a.m. on November 17th. When James opened the door, Jordan ran to him. James found Deborah lying on the living room floor, completely covered by a blanket. James lifted the blanket and saw the large wound to her abdomen, where Elijah had been cut from her womb. James ran to the children's bedroom. He found Samantha lying on the floor, completely covered by a blanket. He lifted the blanket and saw that Samantha's neck had been slashed. Joshua was missing, and James called 911. Several items were missing from the apartment, including James's Grambling State University Tigers starter jacket. Uh Uh-oh. Yeah, that Williams had been wearing. Mm. A pair of poultry shears was found broken in half. At approximately 3.30 a.m., Williams called her sister, Tina Martin, and told her that she had just given birth and that they were at Vicky Iacuyo's house. Tina and her mother then drove to Iacuyo's house. There, Tina and her mother saw Ayacuyo, Williams, Kathy, and a baby. Ayacuyo explained to Tina and her mother that Williams came to Ayacuyo's house and then went into labor. <gasps> what? She then rushed Williams to the hospital where she'd given birth. What? <laughs> oh, my God. So the baby's complexion was so light that Tina asked Ayacuyo, who was white, if the baby was hers. Tina's mother declared that she did not believe that the baby belonged to Williams and Kathy and then asked to leave. This visit lasted only about three to five minutes. Yet, so they so weren't buying it at all. Everyone is really uncomfortable with this strange situation. Yeah, they don't buy it at all. And I think that's really telling. I think that so too. her sister and her mother were like, bullshit. <laughs> no, girl. No, yeah. girl. <laughs> Ma'am. <laughs> Later that morning at daybreak, Patrice got up with her baby Alexis and went to the living room where Joshua was crying. He told Patrice that he had to return to his home because James would not know where he was and Jordan was there alone. Joshua explained that four burglars had entered his home through a window and cut his mother and sister. Patrice asked Joshua who the burglars were and Joshua answered Annette, Laverne, and Fidel and a person Joshua called Boo Boo. Williams had a relative named Bo Wilson, and it's been speculated that this may be the person Joshua called Boo Boo. But to be clear, this fourth individual was never caught nor charged. Joshua repeated what he told Patrice more than three times. He explained that he was hiding, and as the burglars were leaving, he ran outside and bumped into Williams. Dwight was awake in the bedroom watching television with the volume lowered. He overheard Joshua name the four burglars, Annette, Vern, and a name that sounded like Vidal, and a fourth name that Dwight could not understand. Patrice's two older daughters arose and prepared for school. They greeted Joshua. One of them read to him. After they left for school, Joshua told Patrice to, quote, lock the door because the burglars might come back, unquote. Oh, that, mm. poor, that poor baby. I know. Around 9 a.m., Williams returned to Patrice's apartment. Patrice told Williams what Joshua had said. Williams became very upset with Joshua. She accused him of lying. She told him that he talked too much, and she ordered him to, quote, shut his damn mouth, unquote. Uh, uh, no, 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 ma'am. Uh, d- don't talk to Joshua that way. Out yeah. of the mouth of babes. Don't cover the babies now. Uh, so in response, Joshua repeatedly asserted that he was telling the truth. 
oh, I'm so proud of him. <laughs> like, I know. That so there was a, a TV show I watched and they, mm-hmm. they were talking to the grandfather and he was saying how brave Joshua was. Oh, yes, yeah. he is little Joshua. He was telling the truth and that Williams knew he was telling the truth because she was there. Williams told Joshua that he had to take the medicine his mother had left for him. Joshua replied that he did not take any medicine. Wait, okay, little Joshua. Yes. Williams asked Patrice for a glass of water, which Patrice retrieved from the kitchen. Williams took the water and led Joshua into the kitchen. Joshua came out of the kitchen gagging, went to the (gasps) bathroom and vomited. Williams had made him drink iodine. This yeah. woman is Evil. terrible. Oh, yeah. my God. I just find it really so odd that she wanted a baby so bad. She killed a kid. She killed two kids. It is trying to kill a third one. Um, Actually, she killed the mom killed one. and the daughter. And now yes. she's she's trying to kill another kid. Yeah. It just, it's so bizarre to me yeah, that yeah. somebody who wants a baby can do all this killing. Can hurt life babies. in such yeah. a, yeah. So William said she had gifts for Alexis and wanted to check on her own baby. So she wanted Patrice to go with her to her house. Patrice asked Dwight to watch Alexis, but he refused. Dwight's useless. <laughs> Dwight! God damn it, Dwight. You're useless, Dwight. Have he you didn't ever even met a Dwight? <laughs> Have you ever met a Dwight? They are a Dwight. I, I've known a couple of Dwights. They're as useful as a paperweight. That's my impression of all he the Dwights. He couldn't even answer the door. He got I've, up and was like, hey, answer the door Dwight. and went back to bed. God damn it. Come on, Get Dwight. Here, Dwight. Get your shit Jesus. together. Jesus. <laughs> so Dwight didn't do anything anything. So Patrice left the apartment (laughs) with Alexis, Williams, and Joshua. Home alone, Dwight continued to watch television. (laughs) Oh, Dwight! (laughs) On the midday news, he saw a report regarding the murders. The report included a photograph of Deborah and her children. Mm. Dwight recognized Joshua in the photograph. According to Dwight, he got dressed, left the apartment, and looked for a telephone. He could not find one that worked, so he eventually returned (gasps) home. Wait I wonder a minute. If he didn't even Dwight, go. Dwight. <laughs> so Dwight. Dwight gets up after watching the news and is like, I need to find a phone outside of my house. So he goes, Oh, no phones available. No phone. I, Gotta I go tried. back home. Gotta I watch tried. television. Yeah. <laughs> I tried to help. I tried to be a good Samaritan, <laughs> but it just wasn't working out in my favor. So I just went back home <laughs> and watched more TV programs. <laughs> Williams drove with Patrice, Joshua, and baby Alexis to the townhouse in Schomburg that she shared with Kathy and parked in the garage. They went inside and Williams invited Patrice to look around since it was her first time in Williams' home. Look at my beautiful home. Look at these doilies. Remember when people used to have doilies? Yeah, doilies. Uh, and the, I'm just picturing doilies, orange All shag over. carpet, <laughs> green linoleum and appliances. As well as a phone with an excessively long cord. cord. You remember yeah, them? A, a yellow phone, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, they went inside and William invited Patrice to look around since it was her first time. And Joshua stayed with Alexis in the living room. Williams called Patrice upstairs and into a bedroom. Kathy was lying on a bed with a quote unquote really pale baby who had quote streams of blonde hair coming down from his cap and tape across his navel unquote mm. patrice returned to the living room where she gave alexis a bottle of milk later patrice heard william's voice instructing her to bring joshua downstairs to the laundry room patrice did so in the room patrice saw kathy williams and an unidentified man who left soon after patrice at first denied that this man was bo wilson but later positively identified him as bo wilson Patrice, Patrice. <laughs> what's wrong with you? Patrice, do I look like I was born? I was born at night, but I wasn't born last night. Okay, Miss Patrice. <laughs> Joshua was directed to sit on a daybed. Kathy asked Williams why she had brought Patrice to the house. Good question. Mm-hmm. And why she had not taken Joshua to, quote, the projects, unquote, as he had instructed her. So I guess. She was supposed to take him to the projects and just dump him there. I don't know. Oh, my 
God, yeah. it's even more barbaric stuff. <laughs> This woman is as cold as ice. Yeah. Well, actually, Caffey was the one that wanted her to dump him in the projects. And Williams didn't do it. Um, why? I, I kind of think maybe she didn't. She at first didn't want to hurt Joshua. But then oh. she had no choice. Okay. But still, the fact that she did it. I mean, all of this stuff was avoidable, completely avoidable. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah. 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 <laughs> This did not have to happen. So Yeah, no. So Williams answered Kathy when he asked about uh, why she didn't do the things he asked her to do. And she said that Joshua, quote, talked too much, unquote, and that he knew their names. Mm. Williams then picked up a white coaxial cable and Joshua was ordered to lean forward. Kathy and Williams, each pulling on an end of the cable, began to strangle Joshua. He screamed and clutched at the cord. Patrice also screamed and pushed Williams, who released her end. As Joshua was crying and rubbing his neck, Williams left the laundry room, returned with a knife and placed it on the bed. Patrice screamed again and asked Williams to take her and Joshua back to Patrice's home. Williams directed Patrice to get Alexis. So Patrice took Joshua and went upstairs. She tried to leave through the front door, but it was locked. Patrice, with Alexis and Joshua, returned downstairs. Kathy warned Patrice not to say anything or else, according to Patrice. He would, quote, get me and my daughters, unquote. Kathy told Williams to take Patrice home. They all went to the garage and got in the car. Patrice sat in the front passenger seat with Alexis. Joshua sat in the back seat on the passenger side. Kathy entered the car on the rear driver's side, then repeatedly stabbed Joshua. Oh, my God. Oh, no, for a second, I was like, oh, Joshua's getting away. He's going to get away. Yeah, no. Away. Yeah. Oh, poor Joshua. Williams stood along the driver's side of the car and appeared to be reaching inside the car and holding Joshua. He was gasping and kicking the front seat. Oh, poor kid. I I will never understand how somebody can hurt a child. Yeah. It, it is so baffling to me. Yeah. And I just, I can't, it like just doesn't sit right with my spirit. You know, yeah. and before I had kids, I didn't even fuck with kids like that. I didn't like kids. Yeah. But I would. I you, mean, just, you wouldn't hurt them. I wouldn't hurt them. The idea of hurting a child is so like crazy, insane, yeah. preposterous. Why? What? They're innocent kids. Yeah. It, just, it doesn't make any sense. This yeah, really nuts. is upsetting. So Williams then got into the car in the driver's seat and Kathy told her that, quote, she knew where to go, unquote. They drove to Maywood where Kathy and Williams took Joshua from the car and helped him walk to the rear of the building. They stabbed him, and so he he's injured, going to the rear of the building, and they just dumped him. Yeah. Kathy and Williams returned to the car without him. Williams left Kathy in Maywood and drove away. Oh, my God. At approximately 12.15 p.m., Williams and Patrice returned to Patrice's apartment. Williams asked her for cleaning supplies, which Patrice gave to her, and Williams went outside. Dwight told Patrice that he would find a phone to call the police and oh. told her to lock the door after him. Finally, Dwight. Wow. Dwight, Finally, you're doing something. Dwight comes through. Yeah. <laughs> comes through. In the fourth quarter. <laughs> well done, Dwight. When Dwight left, he saw Williams cleaning her car. Eventually, Williams drove away. At some point that day, and what a day it has been. What yeah. a hell of a day. Williams returned the gun she had borrowed to Ayacuyo, telling her, quote, here's the gun back. I shot somebody in a drug deal in Harvey. It jammed, unquote. <laughs> <laughs> here's the gun back. Oh I shot somebody in a drug deal in Harvey. Oh, oh it jammed. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, friend. <laughs> Ayacuyo decided to dispose of the gun. She and her friend Dorothy Hale wiped off the fingerprints and drove to Herrick Lake. While Ayakuyo drove, Hale threw unused bullets into the bushes and then tossed the gun into the lake. All right, let's get into the investigation and the arrest. Is that spooky like Halloween? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good one. Thank you. <laughs> Happy Halloween. 
Halloween. Trick or treat, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> so Dwight Pruitt finally found finally wow, found Dwight, a fan. Dwight, he didn't give up. And that's what's important. <laughs> White did not give up. He finally found a phone and finally contacted the police. Patrice led police to the building where Kathy and Williams had jumped Joshua and Joshua's body was recovered. Way to go, Dwight. Un aplauso for <laughs> Dwight. Aplauso. <laughs> Way to go, Dwight. Where would we be without Dwight? At 11.45 p.m., Caffey and Williams returned home, where police were waiting for them, and they were arrested. Williams was carrying baby Elijah. He was wrapped in a blanket and appeared healthy. Caffey was wearing James's starter jacket, the right cuff of which was stained with blood. I'd be so mad if my, if my stuff was used in a crime scene and it's got blood all over it. You can't get it back until after the you trial. How dare you! Uh, so back at Deborah's apartment, police collected evidence. The bathroom vanity had blood on it. The blood was subsequently determined to be Elijah's. The poultry shears were found with blood on them. DNA tests revealed that the blood belonged to Samantha. I mean, tons, tons and of tons evidence. Yeah. of evidence. <laughs> yeah. Here's more. Police yeah. recovered <laughs> evidence from Patrice's apartment. Whoa. They found an empty iodine bottle in the kitchen garbage. But wait, there's more. In a garbage bag in the garage of Kathy and Williams' townhouse, police found the white coaxial cable with blood on it. DNA tests revealed that the blood belonged to little Joshua. Patrice identified the cable as the one Kathy and Williams used to strangle Joshua. In the dishwasher, police found a rusty wooden handled butcher knife, which Patrice identified as the knife that Kathy had used to stab Joshua. A butcher knife. A little boy. He's eight, oh, yeah. right? Can you imagine yeah. how small Ugh. he is? Like just and butcher knives are gigantic. Exactly. In comparison. Just, yeah. Yes, exactly. Poor little kid. Yeah. Oh. On the back seat carpet of Kathy and Williams's car, police found blood that had been treated with cleaner. DNA tests revealed that the blood belonged to Joshua. In a bedroom closet, police found a bottle of baby lotion with a stain on it. DNA tests revealed that the stain was a mixture of the bodily fluids from Joshua and Elijah. On the kitchen counter, police found two counterfeit births. What? Now they got counterfeit birth certificates? <laughs> Jesus. Uh, counterfeit birth certificates indicating that a baby was born to Williams and Kathy at the hospital on November 16th, 1995. The documents had been typed on William's friend, Vicky Iacuyo's typewriter. <laughs> this is ridiculous. <laughs> Vicky is also the one who provided Williams with the gun. So this is not in the script, but I read somewhere that the birth certificates were like, obviously, obviously fake. And they Obvi were like typos. Clearly. And yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that is not, a so job. not a great job. Wild. Yeah. Although I do wonder to that little baby, I do hope their paperwork and everything got squared away because not having a birth certificate really is. Yeah, uh, I'm sure. I'm sure they got crippling. that squared away. Yeah, yeah. I hope yeah. so. I hope so. I'm sure they did. Yeah. Hi, Vanessa. Hi, Amy. And hi, hi True Crime, Crime fans. fans. We're the co-hosts of She Goes by Jane. Every week, we'll be covering the story of a missing or unidentified woman in the United States. Stories you may have heard before. And ones whose stories didn't make it into the news. We've been covering these stories for a while. First in Amy's book of poetry, Doe. And then in Vanessa's documentary, She. But now we want to share them with you here on She Goes by Jane. And each week, we'll be joined by a special guest. who will read a poem in honor of the women we talk about. Can we say who? We can say who. We'll be joined by actresses like Coco Jones and Gabrielle Ruiz. And musicians like Stephanie Quayle and Kelly Moneymaker, along with authors like Louise Penny and Catherine McKenzie. So check out She Goes by Jane wherever you get your podcasts, or check out Evergreen Podcasts and their true crime channel, Killer Podcasts. We can't wait to bring you these stories. Greetings from Evergreen Podcasts. We're rolling out a listener survey, and we want to hear from you. 
The information in the survey will help us gather statistics and in turn make our shows more appealing to advertisers. I know most people don't like ads, but this is one of the only ways our shows make money and help keep their lights on. We promise it will only take a few minutes, but the impact on our podcasts will be tremendous. As a token of our appreciation, we'll randomly select one lucky participant each month to win an exclusive merchandise package from Evergreen Podcasts. Head to evergreenpodcast.com slash listener survey to help a show and possibly get some free stuff for doing so. We can't thank you enough for the support. Now back to the show. On November 18th, police found a bedsheet stained with Joshua's blood seven blocks from where his body was found. A matching sheet and pillowcase were found in Caffey and Williams's townhouse. So that is a lot of evidence. So much. I mean, piles, mountains yeah. of evidence. I mean, if I were the prosecution, I would just say, jury, just look at this. Look at this. <laughs> look at this mountain. Look at this shit. Look at um, it. Look at all just look of this at evidence. <laughs> I'm not going to say any words. All you have to do is look at this evidence and you will see they are guilty. So on <laughs> December on December 2nd, Iacullo and Dorothy Hale directed police to Herrick Lake in Huyton, where they found a 25 caliber pistol. Police determined that the gun had fired the bullet that was recovered from Deborah's head. What did she say? Um, I used a gun to shoot somebody in a drug deal. Bye! <laughs> <laughs> Kathy denied knowing anything about the murder. <laughs> wow. Okay. <sighs> Williams maintained that she gave birth at a friend's house. <laughs> She's not, she's sticking yeah. with the story, huh? Sticking with the story, yeah. Okay. But little Jordan, who is only 22 months old, was actually able to tell police <gasps> what had happened. Oh, I love these little babies. These yeah. babies, I mean, oh, way to go, little Jordan. In the name of his brother and his sister and his mom. Yeah. yeah. It's really, really. And his little brother, Elijah. So Jordan, right. Jordan really came through. So. When Williams was confronted with the evidence, she eventually confessed to her involvement in the crime, saying that she wanted a light-skinned baby. I want a light-skinned baby to please her boyfriend. Oh, that's so sick. Yeah. But she claimed that she had been in the bathroom when the actual murders took place. So yeah, I, I didn't don't have anything to do with didn't it. Have anything I, to do with it. I wanted a baby, but, yeah. you know, I Not, didn't murder anybody. Come on. Look at me. <laughs> I'm Annette Williams, okay? <laughs> so now let's get into the trial. What the freaking what, Beth? <laughs> Jeez. Vicky Ayacuyo, Dorothy Hale, and a man named Renko Kukik, who supplied the gun to Ayacuyo, were charged with obstruction of justice and weapons charges in connection with the crimes. Wait, Vicky doesn't get to go home? No. Nope. Dang it. No. Oh, Vicky. Poor Vicky. <laughs> Poor Vicky and, and Dorothy. They just got wrapped up in they I feel bad that they these knew horrible Annette. shenanigans. Yeah, they knew these people. Like yeah. I'm so sorry, y'all. So Williams lawyers tried to portray Williams as the victim of an oppressive boyfriend who demanded she have a light skinned son for him. You will have my light skinned babies. <laughs> is so nuts. Yeah. Anyway, they also tried to depict Williams as a savior who breathed air into baby <laughs> Elijah's lungs. Oh my God. Uh, you... Never would have been necessary if he wow. had cut the kid out of his imagine mom. Imagine if her yeah. his mom was still alive. Yeah, just imagine. If baby Elijah's lungs after her boyfriend dropped the boy on the floor. Wow. Yeah. She's, ugh. Yeah. Okay. Assistant public defender Janine Tobin said in closing arguments, quote, Annette Williams may have a lot of defects, but she's not an evil person. Who? She got caught up in a twisted relationship. She was an unwilling participant, unquote. Yeah. Unwilling to fake a pregnancy. Yeah. OK. Yeah. I'm going to say I'm sorry, public defender. I don't, I don't believe, believe it. You. Nope. The prosecutors reminded jurors of the numerous pieces of evidence, circumstantial and physical, linking Williams to the crime scene, including Joshua's own words before he died. Prosecutor Jeff Kendall said in his closing argument, quote, 
Somebody's lying, and it ain't that little boy, unquote. Dwight Pruitt had used the same words when he called 911. Wow. Wow. Okay, Dwight. Wow. Okay. Dwight did something okay. good. Yeah. Dwight good? Dwight good. <laughs> Psychologist Dr. Frank Cushing testified that Williams knew right from wrong at the time of the murders and that, quote, she could have controlled these events, unquote. He said that Williams vehemently denied her involvement in the crimes, even, quote, in the face of overwhelming evidence, unquote, and that she refused to take responsibility for her actions, blaming others instead. Overwhelming evidence. Yeah. So Cushing said... Williams was not psychotic and was not having a psychotic episode during the killings. Nor did Williams tell the doctor that she had been threatened before the murders. And since her incarceration, Williams has been more preoccupied with her lack of freedom or privacy in jail rather than being charged with murder. Like, how dare they charge me with murder? I have to share a bathroom. I cannot go wherever I want. I cannot wake up whenever I want or do whatever I want. This jail is trash. (laughs) Cushing said Williams suffered from clinical depression plus antisocial and bipolar personality disorders, and she had an IQ well below average. All of these factors, quote, made her psychologically vulnerable to predatory males, unquote. I don't know. I don't know about all that. Depression, maybe? I don't know. Uh, But antisocial personality disorder uh, doesn't sound like it. Bipolar, maybe. Maybe. Yeah. 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 And the IQ thing. Every time I see it, I just think racist. Why are they giving this test to people? Yeah. After deliberating for just two hours, the jury found Jacqueline Annette Williams guilty of murder and kidnapping. Williams showed no emotion as the verdict was read. But earlier in the day, she had snapped at a prosecutor who said during closing arguments that she had earned the title of, quote, sick, crazy killer, unquote, to which Williams responded, quote, so have you, unquote. <laughs> Dick Burn, I guess. Hello, well, 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 well. One of Maybe her lawyers. You should revisit that IQ thing. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. Oh, no. I spoke too soon. So one of her lawyers turned to grab her shoulders and calm her down. Caffey maintained his innocence. His defense was that Williams was possessive and jealous. So she planned to trap Caffey by faking a pregnancy, stealing Elijah Evans, and then passing him off as their child. Williams allegedly conspired with Laverne Ward and Vicky Ayacuyo to pull off her plan. All three participants were found guilty. Laverne Ward was sentenced to life in prison plus 60 years. Wow, that's a long time. Fidel Caffey and Annette Williams both received death sentences. So now let's get into where are they now? Tell us, Beth. On January 11th, 2003, the governor of Illinois at the time, George Homer Ryan Sr., concerned with a number of false convictions that were being uncovered, commuted all death sentences in the state of Illinois to life sentences without the possibility of parole. That's an interesting move. Probably a good move, too. Yeah. We've talked about Chicago and... (laughs) You know how, I mean, there's been a lot of politicians in Illinois and Chicago who've gone to prison. Blagojevich, I see you. Also, the police chief in Chicago had a whole torture ring. Yeah. Where people were, for decades, confessing to crimes that they did not commit just to right, stop torture. Right, right. So it was a good move. It yeah. made a lot of sense. Way to go, yeah. governor. Governor, and I don't usually <laughs> say that. Following Deborah's wishes, relatives named her newborn baby Elijah. Family called him Eli. Prosecutors described Eli as, quote, the world's youngest victim of crime. Huh? Okay. Unquote. Because he was a newborn. I see. Okay. Yeah. I mean, there's other babies that this has happened to, but okay. Right. Yeah. But very powerful. And if you wanted to move a jury or sway them in any way. True. Well right. said, yeah. prosecutors. Yeah. Eli and his older brother Jordan were taken in by their maternal grandfather, Sam Evans, in the small town of Bridgeport, Illinois, located about 250 miles south of Chicago, near the border of Indiana. Mm-hmm. Sam said he immediately felt responsible for the two brothers. 
They were all he had left of Deborah, the oldest of his five children. Oh, my gosh. I mean, just tragic, tragic circumstances. But thank goodness for Gramps. For Gramps. Thanks, Papa. Sam recalled that one evening he overheard Jordan whisper to Eli, who was still in a crib, that they were safe now because their grandfather promised to protect them from those bad guys. Sam said, quote, from that point on, there was no doubt we were together and it was going to be for keeps, unquote. That is so sweet and beautiful. It is. Bridgeport is predominantly white. Sam Evans, who is white, tells stories of confronting racism on behalf of his boys, of correcting an embarrassed father whose teenage son used a racially charged word for Eli. But, he said, the problems have been few. White people always say that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah. Uh, it's probably more more problems probably than he's more, aware yeah. of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he took the boys to church with a black Baptist minister in a nearby town to help them identify with their heritage. I think that is really, really wonderful. Yeah. Eli and Jordan began playing varsity football as freshmen. Eli became a star basketball and football player. And throughout his and his older brother Jordan's life, their grandfather cheered them from the sidelines. And I just, these stories don't always have happy like endings. Yeah. But I just think this is really beautiful. that These two young boys had somebody who loved them and took care of them and were doing things that they loved yeah. um, in their lives. So yeah, that's yeah. my take. <laughs> yep. <laughs> what do you got, Beth? <laughs> well, what made them snap? Yeah. Well, these were two pretty fucked up people to begin with. Yeah. And, they became even more fucked up when they got together. When, yeah, yeah. Yeah. What I feel like this never that? would have happened unless they got together, you know? Right. Right. There is something it's called um I forget. It's a French word. It's like a madness of two. Oh. I forget what it's called, but when two people get together and feed on each other <gasps> and yeah. Oh, let me let yeah. me look it up. Hold on. Madness of two. Madness. God, I love having such a smart friend so close by. <laughs> I learned so many things. Um, <laughs> so many big words. Folia du. Folia du. It's uh, folia du. It means madness of two. Oh. It's usually uh, delusions. Oh. But I think this has elements of that. I think so too. Yeah, I don't think this ever would have happened without the two of them getting together. Yeah, they were a talk um, mix for sure. Yes, they were. For sure, for sure. But the story comes from two different perspectives. Williams blames Kathy and Kathy blames Williams. Mm-hmm. It's hard to know exactly what happened, like who yeah. knew what and when. Mm-hmm. But one thing that I do know, though. What do you know? Is that neither one of these people should have been parents. Whoa! <laughs> Okay, hot take alert. Wow, Beth coming in hot. Okay. And uh, Ward was a piece of work too. How he could kill or allow someone else to kill the mother of his child, an unborn child, and allow his baby to see that happen. Yeah. That's horrifying. Yeah, it is. It is. And to be able to kill a child, like we talked about it, two children. I I. Don't. And, yeah. you know, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world right now as we're recording this in the news. And I don't understand. I just don't understand hurting kids. I really yeah. don't. I, I yeah. mean. And just so that you can have a child. Yeah. It's beyond selfishness. Oh, and I'm glad 100%. that they were caught. Yeah. Me too. Me too. And I'm so glad that we got to tell Joshua's story. And yeah. Eli and Jordan. Yes, 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 yeah. yes. And I just, this is a really sad story. It but is. For lack of a better word, a beautiful, I mean, I'm just so grateful that those those two boys have each other and their grandpa and are okay. Yeah, yeah. Relatively okay. I mean. Relatively, I mean, yes. Yeah. I mean. <sighs> Golly. Thanks, Beth. <laughs> Oh, we have more show. We have more Uh-oh. show, yeah. Okay, let's uh, get into how not to get murdered nationwide <laughs> is on your side. Um, okay. <clears throat> if you love true crime and you don't want to die, here's a tip for you. <laughs> 
This segment is not intended to be victim blaming. We thought of this segment because I read somewhere that a lot of people listen to true crime because they want to know what they can do to be safer. This is not meant to blame the victims. It's just learning from other people's experiences. All right, y'all. So these tips come from our friend, damsel in defense, Nancy Abercrombie. And Nancy, we've met her at CrimeCon. Yeah. And she's always got a booth set up with the dopest, littiest self-defense gadgets and gizmos. Reasonable prices. You're supporting women with small businesses, et cetera, et cetera. So she sells these cool things. And she's also agreed to provide us with some tips. So warning signs of abusive behavior sourced by the hotline.org. Beware of showing jealousy of your friends or time spent away from them. If a partner does that, red flag. Yeah. Insulting you, demeaning or shaming you, especially in front of other people. Big red flag. Yeah. Huge. Controlling finances in the household without discussion. Red flag. And this includes taking your money or refusing to provide money for necessary expenses. Mm. Red fucking flag. Yeah. Also intimidating you through threatening looks or actions. Red flag. Preventing you from making your own decisions, including about working or attending school. Fuck. Dangerous stuff. We saw some of that in the story. Thank you, Damsel in Defense, Nancy. And yeah, thank you. you can visit Damsel Ninja Nancy on Instagram and our link will Is also that be- her handle? Damsel yeah. Ninja Nancy? Okay. Damsel Ninja Nancy on Instagram or <laughs> link in the show notes. Now, okay, great. Ooh, shout out time where we shout out any content by people of color or any marginalized folks or about them and um, any true crime goodies. So I got two things okay the devil on trial on netflix holy fucking shit it's very good it's about the satanic panic and ed and linda lorraine warren lorraine yeah. warren the conjuring yeah. folks the conjuring <laughs> couple and this family has decided to tell their story about that murder that took place and the haunting that we all believed took place and so revealing. Um, I won't spoil it, but come talk to us about it on our video club. Also, Unseen and Unheard is a podcast about people with schizophrenia telling their stories. We all have mental health, right? But some of us have mental illness. And this is about people with their mental illness, schizophrenia, telling us about their lives. So it's really cool. Awesome. What do you got? Well, I don't really have that much. Uh Uh-huh. But for Halloween, I wanted to mention that Get Out, Us, and Ma are now on Netflix. I saw that, friend. Yeah. And oh, my (laughs) God. (laughs) I figured you'd be excited about that. Yeah. Yeah, you know that meme of that little brow girl? She's, like, just so excited. (laughs) That's me right now. (laughs) Woo! And then Spooked Podcast is back for spooky season. Yes, yes. Uh, We've shouted out before. It features true life supernatural stories told firsthand by the people who experience them. It's hosted by Glenn Washington of Snap Judgment. Yes. yes. You know it's good. We love you, Glenn. Yeah. And then Fall of the House of Usher on Netflix. Mm -hmm. Started it. The cast is pretty diverse. Yeah. And then a true crime goodie for you, Wendy. Huh? Huh? Impact of Influence, the Murdaugh family murders. I know you're fascinated by that story. I can't believe I'm so riveted by these red-headed, rich, white people. <laughs> white people I, I know. can't look away. I just can't. <laughs> oh, it's on our network. Yay! Yeah, it's a podcast on our network, Killer Podcasts. Yay! Yeah. Oh, oh my gosh. We should do a, like... We should do something with them. What's up, Impact? Yeah. Get at us. <laughs> my name's Wendy, and that's my friend, Beth. Hello. Uh, <laughs> all- <laughs> um, okay. Well, so just to recap, that's The Devil on Trial on Netflix, Unseen and Unheard, wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, Netflix is really getting, oh, man. You're going you're gonna to dive into Netflix, and you're not going to be able to get out until 2024 <laughs> starts. You got Get Out. You got Us. You got Ma. All on Netflix. 
Also, another podcast, Spooked, wherever you get your podcasts. Hello. And Fall of the House of Usher, a program on Netflix. Hello. And another podcast, Impact of Influence, the Murdaugh Family Murders. Here on this network, killer podcasts on the Evergreen Network. Yeah. So, uh, oh, normally I'm sad at the end of the show, but I'm but now excited, you're excited for to go to bed. sleep. <laughs> yes. So uh, where can the people find us, Beth? Our website is fruitloopspod.com and we use Fruit Loops Pod for all of our social media. The footnotes for each episode can be found on our website. Plus, check it out for the different ways that you can support the show and become a Fruit Loops patron. You can also support us by supporting our sponsors or by giving us a five-star review. Five stars only, please. Five stars only, please. Also, don't forget to subscribe, Yeah, which helps us a lot. Yes, it does. Now, listen close. Come on in. Come on in. Come on in. Okay. <laughs> Make sure those headphones are secure in your mm -hmm. ear holes. This is a weekly podcast and new episodes drop every Thursday. So until next time, look alive, y'all. It's crazy out there. Hello, Instagram, or <laughs> my family doesn't want to be seen with me. Also, <laughs> nationwide is on your set. And I can't stop watching all the people. Everyone is really uncomfortable with this strange situation. A great suburban, wave. A great suburbanization. <laughs> to build my new... Horror Hotel. Horror Hotel. <laughs> Happy Halloween! Happy Halloween! <laughs> we can all see this is not going to end not well, right? Going well, okay. yeah. Look at my beautiful home. <laughs> Look at these doilies. Remember when people used to have doilies? Yeah, doilies. <laughs> uh, what? Oh my God. Is there a German word for it? What is it? Uh... <laughs> no, girl. No, yeah. girl. Mm -mm, Ma'am. <laughs> Dwight's useless. Dwight! God damn it, Dwight. You're useless. Come on, Get Dwight. Here, Dwight. Get your shit Jesus. together. Finally, Dwight. Wow. Dwight, Finally, you're doing something. Dwight comes through. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. Okay, Dwight. Wow. Okay. Dwight did something okay. good. Yeah. Dwight good? Dwight good. <laughs> Patrice. Pat what's wrong with you? Patrice overwhelming evidence yeah look at all <laughs> Just look of this at evidence <laughs> yeah here's more but wait there's more um i used a gun to shoot somebody in a drug deal bye <laughs> like how dare they charge me with murder this jail is trash <laughs> to which williams responded quote so have you unquote <laughs> Sick burn, I guess. Well, 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 well. That's yeah. my take. Yep. <laughs> Nationwide <laughs> is on your side. By the people who experienced it, experienced it, experienced them. Brad, are you okay over there? <laughs> experienced it, it did them. <laughs> <laughs> Williams answered Wait, that Joshua. Oh, oh. Uh, that's mine. Get oh. off of my. I'm script. sorry. I'm sorry. Get you know what else? Off my script. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Ted. You I know, know what else okay. I wanted to say? You know what? Even though I hate this time of year, 
there's like no shortage of disturbing content. I and know. I'm surprised you don't love this time of year. I know. I might have to rethink all of this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm so sleepy. I just need to go to sleep. Are you just losing your mind? No, I'm, I am. <laughs> okay, let's wrap it up. Yeah, wrap it up. <laughs> wrap, wrap it up. up. Wrap it up. <laughs> All righty. Uh, in that case, okay. Night, night. All right. Bye. Let's go. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Listen to Mr. Bunker's Conspiracy Time podcast. It's a fun show about weird stuff. New episodes every Wednesday, yeah, eggheads. I'm Art. And I'm Andy. And Mr. Bunker's Conspiracy Time is a podcast about conspiracies, the paranormal, UFOs, unsolved mysteries. We're, we're going to be discussing the Kennedy assassinations. Oh, yeah. That's his nickname, Finger Banging Bob Lazar. Give me some aliens with some good frickin' spacecraft. The whole enchilada. <laughs> the only thing bigger than Bigfoot's feet are our egos. If you like simulation theory, ancient history, egghead science, and Mandela effect, that kind of stuff. So check it out. New episodes every Wednesday. All the links you need on MrBunkersConspiracyTime.com. And we'll see you in the bunker. Three AM, the comedy horror podcast that holds weekly gatherings around the campfire. Let me tell you what you're going to get. You're going to hear stories about demonic possessions, prison stabbings, skinwalkers, glitches in the Matrix, cult leaders, missing four one one, night marchers, Operation Paperclip. Mesopotamian devil worship and so many monsters it'll give Kanye West a runaway for his money. Pop and meme culture also aren't off topic. A camp where laughs and scares are constantly competing for first place. We're just a group of friends trying to bust each other's balls, find the best stories, and expand the circle in the process. 3AM, the comedy horror podcast not for the faint or fragile of heart. Let's go. Let's go.